Have a seat. Hi, hi. All right, let's get started. So, hope you're enjoying sleeping in an hour longer than usual this Monday. Hope you're all extra fresh. We have 45 minutes of drug response prediction, as explained by Dr. Vagwetsos from the NKI. <coughs> uh, we've had more talks from from that institute, but this is from a separate group entirely. Um, Dr. Vagwetsos, thanks for giving this talk. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. As uh, Bart said, I'm from the Netherlands Cancer Institute, and my group. Uh, uh, is mostly doing computational work, so we have a small experimental component that we recently started. Um, so we uh, basically study broadly how patients uh, respond to therapy and why they respond to particular therapies. For that we use uh, different approaches, and the ones that I'm going to talk about today uh, is one that we developed in the past years, basically to try and predict response of patients to therapy. Um, so I'm mostly going to talk about the first one. That's also the paper that you uh, had to read. So how many of you managed to read the paper? Okay, how many of you have a lot of questions about the paper? Oh, great. So we can go home. <laughs> uh, the second uh, part, we'll see whether we get to that. That is a, a follow-up on tandem. So in tandem, we basically... Uh, Define the hierarchy, so what is upstream and what is downstream. <coughs> and then in ITOP, we basically look into whether we can actually use the data to infer what the hierarchy is between the data is. So what should we be using in the first stage and what should we be using in the second stage. Uh, maybe you can give me an indication what your backgrounds <coughs> are. How many of you have a bachelor in molecular biology? How many of you have a bachelor in computer science? Okay, so it's a nice mixed bag. What, what, what did the others uh, do for a bachelor? Biomedical sciences. Biomedical sciences? So how many of you biomedical scientists? Okay, so that roughly makes up the, the remaining ones. Okay, so the minority have a, have a quantitative background, if I can put it that way. All right. Um, so this is the basic problem. Uh, as I said in my group and also in our institute, is how can we respond? How can we predict which patient will respond best to which drug? So, now in our institute we get uh, thousands of patients that come into the institute every year. So, <coughs> in this paper we use cell lines, but you can also argue, why don't I just collect data from all these patients? They come into the institute, uh, the doctor takes a biopsy, or they get an operation. We get some tissue from the tumor. We can profile that tissue with all the techniques that you've probably already learned about. Uh, I assume you've had exposure to gene expression data. <coughs> mm -hmm. yes. You've had exposure to proteomics data. Yeah. Uh, you know what mutations are. You know what copy number changes are. So we can do all these measurements on these tumors from the patients. And then we can wait for a certain period of time and see what the outcome of that patient is. Did the, did the therapy help or did the therapy not help? So we have the responders and the non-responders. Yes? Are the things you based on this data, are there biops or is it a full tumor? So this data is based on cell lines, but we'll get to that in a second. But the story I'm telling now, that could be either a biop. So you have two modes of treating patients. You can either say, I do it in a new adjuvant setting, so that's basically saying, I leave the tumor in the patient, I take a biop, I can profile the biop, and then I give the therapy to the patient, and then I can see how that tumor that's still in the patient responds to the therapy. So that's, of course, very useful from a response perspective. And it's usually uh, to shrink the tumor so that you can better <coughs> operate on the tumor, because you preferably don't want to leave the tumor in the patient. The other option is that you, morning, no worries. The other option is that you remove the tumor surgically, you profile the tumor, and then you get treatment, and that's called adjuvant. But then you don't have the tumor in the patient to see how it responds. You have to wait for five or ten years to look at the outcome of the patient. Did the, the, the new metastasis occur, or did the patient die, and so forth. Yeah, the thing I'm wondering is because uh, you have so many different types of cells yeah. in just one tumor, so that's mm -hmm. why 
wondering how this really can relate to predicting <coughs> like the real therapy because you can just look if you take only a biopsy or if you take like a certain type of the tumor itself and you base on this data and you base your response to the drug, you can still not really be sure if you take the right decision, right? Because you have all those different yeah. cell types. Yeah, that's a very good point. So there is in the tumor heterogeneity, so you can even have different clones in the same tumor that are driven by different drivers. Uh, there is usually a strong driver, but there is polyclonality, so heterogeneity in the same tumor. And in, in addition to that, uh, there's also the tumor microenvironment, so the, the tissue that grows around the tumor or even infiltrates the tumor. Uh, the immune system is, of course, a very important component, especially nowadays with immune therapy and fighting tumors. So knowing what the composition of the microenvironment is is also very important. So you've touched upon a very important point, and that is that heterogeneity is... Uh, is a big problem in cancer, and especially if you take a biopsy, you only take a small sample from a tumor mass, and the question is always, is that representative of the tumor? And even if the patient has metastasis, <coughs> then that question is even more acute, because then there are multiple sites where there are tumor, cell, tumor cells, and we don't know whether you can actually uh, represent all of those different sites with the one biopsy you take from one of the particular samples. So that's a very important point. Uh, we'll get back to that when we go to the actual <coughs> paper. So my question to you was originally, why can't I just use the setting where I have a number of patients that come into the institute, I sample them, I molecularly profile the tumor, I wait a certain number of months or perhaps years, and then I can compare the respondents and the non-respondents. What, what are the disadvantages of that approach? The patients, they probably wait some years to see the results are. The patients don't want to wait an, a, a long time? Basically, I think they want a treatment that works best. They want right a treatment now. that works best, but this is sort of a, a long-term approach. So, I mean, after you've had the first cohort of tumors that you got the response, you maybe improve the prediction for, that, for the next ones. And that touches upon, I think, the problem. Any other reasons why this is not such a... Yes? Sample size is usually quite small. Uh, <clears throat> yes, that could be a problem, uh, but if you have, you can have large cohorts, so that could be that could, could be could be overcome, but it could be a problem. Other other issues, yes. As so many in these cell lines, other studies have done <coughs> have been done with the same data set, so you can maybe compare the results to other published work in the same cell line. With the cell lines, yeah. Let's leave the cell lines for for a minute. Mm -hmm. Just about the approach with patients. What's the uh, work for that? Yeah. You cannot just like. Yes, that's probably the most important limitation. In the clinic, we limit it to what is clinical practice. So the, the oncologist cannot just decide today, okay, I think the drug is going to work, I'm going to give it to the patient. There's a protocol that he has to stick to. And <clears throat> even if there is a new drug, there's always a clinical trial, which also takes a lot of time. You have a control arm and an experimental arm. There has to be lots of evidence for the drug working. So that, I think, apart from the other things that you've mentioned, is probably the biggest drawback is that you cannot just go about experimenting on patients with 265 drugs. <coughs> so that's why people have devised model systems, which are uh, such as cell lines. So you know what cell lines are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they basically take cells from the tumor and they try to get them to grow in a dish. Now that's immediately one of the drawbacks of the cell lines, is they are tumor cells that manage to grow in a dish. All the other tumor cells don't grow in a dish. So the heterogeneity that you pointed out earlier may be lost. The cell lines are fairly homogeneous in terms of their composition, especially in terms of cell type. Now, other model systems have been devised, so you may have heard about organoids. So those are more representative systems. They grow in three dimensions instead of two dimensions like the cell lines. And an additional model system is a, a PDX model. So that's where you take a tumor and you transplant it into a mouse and then uh, the mouse provides the vasculature and the immune system, albeit not a human immune system, but that's also a model system, and then you can treat the mouse and see how that tumor responds to it. Very costly, and you don't do these numbers. So the case for cell lines is that it's a very easy system. Uh, you can do large-scale experiments. So this is about 1,000 cell lines and 265 drugs, and you can test them all 
and then you can uh, see which ones of these respond uh, and which ones don't. And importantly, we can, of course, profile them for these different molecular data types, the mutations, the copy number aberrations. We know which uh, uh, tissue type the cell line originates from, uh, and we can profile the methylation and the gene expression as well. Uh, so this was just a, a slide to show that the cell lines uh, are not completely poor model systems. So this is from a paper that we published two years ago, where this big screen was actually done, the GDSC 1000, where I actually extract most of the data from. And over here you see FDA approved drugs, different drugs. Here you see the target that the drug actually uh, hits. So this particular like uh, lapatinib uh, inhibits ERBB2, which is an amplification that often occurs in breast cancer. And over here you can see that if there's a green uh, blob, it means that we could recover this association between uh, a biomarker, in this case this, and the particular drug from the data. So the cell lines do re recapitulate many of the associations that we already know and are being used in the clinic. So they're not completely poor model systems, but we have to keep in mind their drawbacks. Okay, so you've also had exposure to machine learning approaches. <coughs> mm -hmm. So this is now a classical problem, so I'm not looking at all 265 drugs. I'm just looking at a single drug, in this case a MEK inhibitor. So if I talk about pathways such as MAP kinase and PIP kinase, does that make sense to you? Okay. If they don't, put up your hand and I'll explain to it because a lot of it will be depend on knowledge of those things. So we have here a classical machine learning problem. Now we have uh, 926 cell lines. So these are my samples. I profiled them for all these different features. So these are the, the data sets. So these are the features. So one expression of one gene here is a feature. The mutation of a gene here is a feature. And I have a target here. Now the target here is the response of that cell line to a drug. So maybe I can just quickly explain to you what that is. What we use here is the, is the IC50. So that's uh, the concentration at which you kill 50% of the cells. So the assay that you do is that you change the concentration of whatever drug, so let's say the MEK inhibitor, and on this axis we measure the, the viability of the cell, so how many of them remain in the dish. So at the beginning we have 100% of the cells, and as we increase the concentration of the drug, this curve does more or less something like this. So at a very high concentration, I've killed all the cells. At the low concentration, nothing has happened. And then uh, where we kill 50% of the cells, that concentration, that's called the IC50. So that is our target value that we actually use in our classifier. So the response of a, of a drug will be measured in terms of the IC50. If it's low, it's a very sensitive cell line. If it's high, it's a very resistant cell line. Anyway, okay, so, so I've shown here a particular classifier, the elastic neck regression. So have you worked with that? No. No and yes. So uh, have you learned about the P much larger than N problem? Yeah, I see many heads nodding. I'll just repeat it quickly. The fact is we have here many features. We have for gene expression alone about 17,000 features, for methylation 14,000 features, we have many features, and we only have 926 samples. So these samples live in a, in a, a 30,000 plus dimensional space, so it's a very sparsely populated space, and you can very easily fit the line through these things to explain the drug response accurately, but then when you go to a new data set, and you ask your classifier to predict the response on a new data set, then the response is the predicted performance is very poor. So that's a problem we have to keep in mind. And the elastic net regression is a technique that does feature selection. Uh, so it selects which of these gene expression features or mutations or copy number are useful for prediction. And uh, based on the selected features, it then creates a model that says how you should combine those features to predict the drug response. Okay, so this is a method that uh, takes care of this P much greater than N problem. So we have our data, we put it in our elastic net regression and that predicts the response to a particular drug, let's say MEK inhibitor, and then we do that for each of the 265 drugs. So when we build a classifier, there's basically two things that we want to achieve. 
On the one hand, it might be that you just want to use it in the clinic and it has to be as accurate as possible. So then it's, you can use a black box technique because you don't care what's going on inside. You don't really care which features have been selected by elastic gate regression. The only thing you care about is that it predicts the response very accurately. Then you can use it in the clinic and it's reliable. The other thing that we also want to do, because I said at the beginning, we want to understand drug response. So we tend to want to look into the elastic net and say, well, it selected this particular gene uh, expression to classify the response. So that helps us to understand why cell lines or patient responds to a drug or not. So it helps us to understand the mechanism, it helps us to make better drugs apart from just uh, selecting the patients for uh, a particular drug. So in this case, we actually have more interest in interpreting what's going on in the classifier. The performance doesn't need, doesn't, uh, uh, shouldn't decrease, but we're also interested in understanding the drug response by looking at the features selected by the classifier. <coughs> the so since we are faced with many data types here, so a question that always arises, because this is a costly procedure to profile for all these different uh, data types, is there a data type that's most predictive? If there's one single data type that's highly predictive and we're not so uh, interested in understanding how uh, patients respond, then we only need to profile the, the tumors for that one data type. We save a lot of money and we can predict accurately. It may be that there's multiple data types that are predictive and then the question is always, well, how should we combine them to make the best predictor? And in this case, we were also interested in knowing uh, whether we can understand why cell lines respond and don't respond to data. To, to drugs. So this is the data set. I've added the numbers of features here. So you can see these two are very large. So together, more than 31,000 features. Uh, smaller numbers of mutations and copy number features. So the first approach that uh, I'm going to show you is just to say, well, to answer the question, well, is there which, which data type is most predictive? We can just take each data set separately. So the mutations, <laughs> copy number, cancer type, methylation, and so forth. We put them through the elastic net regression and we ask how well can we predict response to all the different drugs. So that's one data type at a time. And if we now measure the predicted performance here, uh, which is now the correlation between what our classifier predicts, so the predicted IC50 and the actual IC50, uh, that is the, 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 the measure of our uh, classifier's performance. And here the data types we see that mutation and copy number is the least predictive. It does contain information, but not at a very high level. The cancer type uh, has much more information, methylation as well, but gene expression is the best in terms of achieving the highest accuracy in predicting response. So each of the data types individually do contain information. Gene expression contains the most. Now the second approach is to say, okay, now let's use all the data types together because they all seem to contain information. And the only thing we do is instead of using a data type separately, we just paste them together and we say we have now one big data set of 926 samples or cell lines and a large number of features in excess of 31,000 uh, features. And now we shove that into our elastic net and we ask elastic net which features are most predictive and can you make the classic. And what happens then is that mostly gene expression features are selected. So this is now a representation of the relative contribution of each of the data types here. Um, so what we basically do is compute the sum of squares of the total prediction and we just express a particular data type's contribution as a fraction of that. So what you can clearly see is the median contribution of gene expression is almost 100% and the others have a median contribution of almost zero. But you'll also notice is there are some drugs here where mutation data does have a, a much larger contribution. But clearly gene expression dominates if we just put them all together into a classifier. So this is a summary of the individual contribution of the data types, and this is the overall performance when we use them all. And not surprisingly, this is very comparable to gene expression because gene expression is the most dominant data type. <coughs> So gene expression is a good predictor, but in my opinion, and I don't know whether you have looked at gene expression signatures, they typically are not so interpretable. Have you bought classifiers where you obtain a list of genes that 
predict and phenotype, and what did you do with those features to make to try and make sense of them? Or did you just leave it as it was? What's the simplest thing you can do? Suppose you build a classifier for predicting response to a MEK inhibitor and you obtain 50 genes that were selected by elastic net. What would you then do with those genes to try and understand why these cell lines respond and others don't respond to MEK inhibitors? So there's, the, there's the corresponding heat map you might have obtained. These are the responders and the non-responders and here are the gene expression features selected. So clearly you can see high expression here is associated with response for these genes and low expression associated with with response for those genes. So what, what, what can you do with this list of genes to make some sense of why why these cell lines respond to a mechanism? Look them up in the database. You can look them up in the database. They all have names. You can see what their functions are and then try to link that to uh, to uh, to the response. What else can you do? Yes? Maybe you can use something like Enrique to see if, for example, that response genes can really respond the same. What, what was it? Uh, Yes, pathway enrichment. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You can you can use. Uh, I'll show you results later on. You can download the CAC or the MCTB or whatever, annotate the database, and you can say, well, these genes that I found in my signature, where do they fit in? Maybe if I'm lucky, they all have kinase genes. Yeah, those are things that you can do. Um, those are all typically uh, uh, the gene set enrichment is unbiased, but. The first approach, which is mostly used, is you browse down the list and you find some genes that you recognize, you find some genes that you don't recognize, those you throw away, and the other ones you tend to focus on, so it's, it's a lot of cherry picking. In general, a lot of these genes uh, don't make sense, a small fraction maybe do make sense, so what I think, what is useful to remember here is that if you have a signaling pathway, so this is a signaling pathway from a surface receptor down the MAC kinase pathway, and you might have a BRAF mutation here. So in cancers, of course, these pathways are often affected. So you often see mutations in MAP kinase, in breast cancer, the surface receptor ERBM2 is amplified. So that's a mechanism of the cells to, to be, become a tumor. They uh, are independent of growth signals, and they just activate these mitogen pathways. Of course, they need additional hallmarks in order to become a cancer. So let's say we take a tumor with a BRAF mutation that activates the MAP kinase pathway. That uh, cell line uh, becomes addicted to that mutation because if you inhibit that mutation, the cell lines typically die. Uh, that, of course, activates transcription factors, and the transcription factors activate genes, and that <coughs> results in a gene expression signature. So you can think of the gene expression signature as a kind of fingerprint of what happens upstream in the signaling pathways. Um, but I think we're not, we not, since we want to interpret how the drugs work, we're not really interested in the downstream fingerprints. We want to know what's going on upstream here. So for that reason, we said, okay, these data types do contain some information. We saw that in the bar graph. The correlation is not zero. It's not super high. But we want to give these data types a first shot at explaining, gene, uh, explaining drug response. And once they've had all their opportunity to explain drug response, then we go back. And what we cannot explain, we explain with what we call the downstream data types. Now, we can argue about what is upstream and downstream. Uh, we can say, well, cancer type is maybe not an upstream feature, but it's uh, downstream because that's the final result of mutations, gene expression changes, and so forth. You can also argue the tissue where a tumor starts is a determinant of what mutations will start, will, will be tolerated there, or will actually give a growth advantage. So that's a bit of a tricky one, but uh, we can get back to that if you have questions about that. But for now, we just decided, okay, these data types are uh, upstream, like mutations, copy number, especially, are upstream of gene expression as well as methylation. And cancer type is much more interpretable since it tells us which tissue the, the cell line comes from, so therefore we put them in one class which we call upstream and the gene expression is downstream. And what we did with the flat model was to treat all the data types equally, as equally important. So they all get, got an equal shot at explaining drug response. <coughs> what we now do with tandem is we first take the upstream data, 
and we try and explain as much of the drug response as we can. And the part of the drug response that we cannot explain, so the difference between what we predicted uh, for the IC50s and what the actual IC50s are, uh, or residuals, as they call the regression, we then try to explain this remaining part, these residuals, by the gene expression data in the second stage. So remember that when we used the flat model, gene expression dominated the classifiers because they had the, a median contribution of about 100% of the other data types contributed very little. If we now look at tandem, we see that gene expression is still dominant, but not so dominant as before. It's around 50% uh, relative contribution, and the other data types now contribute according to their, according to the amount of information that they that they contained originally, so proportionally to that, that uh, correlation that we obtained when we looked at the data types individually. And importantly, when we look at the performance of a tandem and the flat model, we don't, uh, we don't pay any price there. So the performance of tandem and the flat model are very comparable. Okay, now what I promised you is interpretability. So the question is now, are these features that are being selected by TAM indeed more interpretable? And one approach that we followed was just to take what, what uh, your colleague said earlier. We take the features from tandem, we take the features selected by the flat model, so in both cases selected by elastic neck regression, and then we go to an annotated database, in this case the Keck database, and we, we ask in the database what fraction of these features from tandem versus the flat model are actually annotated in this database. Because if more of these features are annotated, we basically collectively know more about them than if they're not annotated. And a way to do that is just to ask whether the features in tandem are enriched in pathways in, uh, in KEG, or whether the flat model is enriched for uh, pathways in KEG. And if we find many more pathways enriched, it means that we actually have more information for the one versus the other. And as you can see, tandem has a little bit less than three times more pathways in which so many more of the features that are selected by tandem are also uh, annotated in databases. <coughs> yes? Uh, the features you talk about, is it all features that are not zero, or is it uh, only the features that are higher, significantly higher than the rest of the features? No, there's the ones that are non-zero, because in the elastic net, it it yeah, typically yeah. sets features to yes, no, zero. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we don't take the contribution of a feature. I mean, in the end, you get a beta coefficient for the feature that's, that's shrunk. Mm -hmm. So we don't take the size of the coefficient into account as long as it's non zero. Okay. Um, this is just an example of that. So this is the map kinase pathway from the CAC database. So, and here we looked at all the features that were selected for. Uh, uh, MEC response, so there's different MEC inhibitors in the database and we look at different uh, uh, elastic net regressors that were obtained for MEC responses, so here is the MAP kinase pathway from the surface receptors uh, RAS, RAP, MEC, ERP, down to uh, MEC, the transcription factor. So you can see that both methods select uh, features within the pathway, because that's what you would expect if you inhibit in the pathway. Uh, whether there are mutations upstream or downstream will affect the response to this particular drug. If you have an activation downstream, you won't have any effect with inhibiting upstream because the cell line doesn't care about upstream inhibitions. If you have a mutation upstream, then of course uh, uh, an inhibition downstream of that activation will have effect on the cell lines. Um, and you see in dark green two that are added by tandem that are not selected by uh, the flat model. <coughs> okay, so here are two additional examples I just wanted to show you to kind of convince you that the interpretability is, is, is better in tandem. So we computed what we call the feature importance. So we build a classifier or a predictor with a feature, and then we build a classifier without the feature. And if that feature is very important, the performance of the classifier, of course, falls apart when you take that feature apart, and then it's very important. So in this case, it's the flat model. We can see that the BRAF mutation is quite important, uh, whereas it also selects a number of gene expression features that are less important. Um, 
the main thing is that the CLAD model, of course, has a strong preference for gene expression features. I think my pointer is... Uh, You the batteries on it. Sorry? I'll change the batteries on it. <laughs> I think I have some batteries. Okay, so the feature importance, so the BRAP mutation is being selected as most important for MAP kinase targeting drugs again, so not surprising because BRAP is an important player in that pathway. Um, if we now look at tandem, we still select BRAP now with a bit more importance, but we also select KRAS, NRAS, and this translocation of EUVS fly 1. So, of course, these two are, make a lot of sense if you just look at them because they're also in that same pathway that we are targeting. In addition, we don't select any gene expression, but we do select cancer types. So this, these are all leukemia. This is a leukemia, lymphoblastic leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, chronic myeloid leukemia, and this is a small cell lung cancer, and this is skin cutaneous melanoma. So more cancer types are being selected. Uh, we look into this a bit more. So if you look at uh, melanoma or skin cancer, this gene BIN3 is actually a good reporter for that tumor type. Uh, we only found that out afterwards by asking why are these genes actually selected and <coughs> discovering that they well correlated with the presence of skin cancer. So what the PLAT model does is rather than selecting the cancer type, it now selects gene expression biomarker that's more representative for that tumor type. And the same happens for these two types of leukemia. These two genes are very good predictors of whether a cell line is from these two cancer types. So I think you'll agree with me that if I have a classifier that tells me that these uh, mutations that are in the pathway where I'm inhibiting, uh, as well as that I can give this particular drug preferentially to these uh, cancer types is more useful and more interpretable than one with a lot of gene expression data uh, features that we have to dig into to understand why they are actually selected. Okay, and then there are some uh, uh, features that are actually very similar between tandem and the flat model. So this uh, Schlafen 11 gene expression is selected by both tandem and by the flat model for the prediction of DNA damaging agents. So there's actually no replacement for that. This expression is not caused by some kind of upstream change. Uh, this is a, a more or less autonomous gene expression feature. So in this uh, presentation, in, these pa in this paper, I've shown you that flat models are dominated by gene expression. So, which basically means that most of the information in the other data types is captured by gene expression. Tandem provides the predictive performance, and hopefully I've shown you that tandem models are a bit more interpretable than the uh, flat model. So we have 10 minutes, so we can, I can answer your questions. I think that's more preferable. Yes? The first is dealt with more pathways. That's a good question, which I don't know the answer to off the top of my head. Um, of course, in the, in the statistical test, that's compensated. So that's corrected for, right? Because you, you have your whole CAG database, you look at a pathway of a particular size, and then you look at your signature, which is, let's say, 100 genes and you ask whether the number of MAP kinase genes in that 100 is more than you would expect given the fraction of MAP kinase in the total. So if you have a signature of 100 versus 10, the test corrects for that. But, but it's an interesting question. I don't know that off the top of my head. Yes? Uh, in, the, in the feature important, where you showed that BRAP was really important in both cases, but the feature report was, was more important in the tandem. Yeah. Well, what you also have to bear in mind is that the, 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 the elastic network pressure uh, is not a univariate, so it's a, it's a multivariate classifier, so it takes all the features 
in the conservation together. So there might be some interplay, some correlations between different features, which in one case makes it a little bit less or more important, depending on what other features you see. For example, this you see this 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 one DUSP6, that's a gene expression feature that we now in the in the meantime have learned is a is a negative regulator of the Kinase pathway, so very logical and very close to the pathway. So that's only being selected by gene expression. So BRAF, in the presence of DUSP6, will do something a little different than BRAF in the presence of all these, because then DUSP6 is not selected here anymore. Could it also be because you select more of genes that are uh, regulated by BRAF that uh, those genes, like oh, that's a good point. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, are part of that. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, I didn't think about that. That's a very logical explanation. Yeah, according to the signature, uh, this thing. Yeah, I mean, this is true. Then uh, the genes that are here are more correlated with BRAF. Yeah, so that could be that some of the variance in BRAF is already explained by the gene expression. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the, the tandem is is better for human interpretation. So you can directly see if the drug is better for a certain type of cancer. Um, but does that matter in terms of uh, giving treatment to patients? Because you can just uh, get a gene expression from the patient. And no, then that's based on that, you, you decide what type of drug should be, right? Yeah, no, that's, you're right. That's why I tried to distinguish at the beginning between the two different things you might want to achieve. On the one hand, just accurately predicting mm -hmm. as cheaply as possible, typically, if you want to make a clinical application. <coughs> you don't care about interpretability. You just want to have a classifier that works as accurately as possible, possible and as cheap as possible. Uh, this is more because we wanted yeah. to, to understand why uh, why cell lines respond and why others don't respond. But that is just something important to keep in mind if you want to apply it clinically. Yes. yes. Uh, in the pathway enrichment, um, are all the, the enrichments you found in Fatmo are they all contained in the enrichments you found with Tandem, or are the ones that you lose? Uh, that's a good question which I don't know the answer to off the top of my head. Of my head. Um, I would say no. I would guess no. What would you expect? Well, I, I would also, well, it wouldn't make sense to me that you lose some if you take a broader view at, at all the features. But I was just wondering if maybe relevant, relevant information might be lost if you, so would you advise in using both a flat model and a tandem approach and then seeing what the overlap is and what falls out, or would you advocate just solely using standards? Yeah, I think I would certainly, if I've, I'm, I'm looking to understand what's going on there, then I would certainly follow both approaches, because clearly, I mean, I, I, I was a bit one-sided in emphasizing the importance of, of you know, that this is, this is overall more interpretable, because we can make sense of many more of the features, but this is an important feature that's not present here, so in that sense you would lose that. And it's even annotated in the database, so <laughs> it's not just uh, me standing here saying it's important. It's already in the database as a clear negative regular. So yeah, I think both approaches would. But if I would look at the, at the enrichment, I think it also depends on what fraction of the tandem features are gene expression versus uh, the other, which I also uh, cannot give you the answer to right now. So if it's a large fraction of that is still gene there's still a large number of gene expression features, then you might expect more overlap, yeah. although the gene expression features might be explaining different phenomena now because the other uh, things like the VRAF signature have already been taken care of by the VRAF mutation. So yeah, it could, could go either way. But I would guess that they would be different. That there would be, just like in the feature sets, also some overlap, but that you would also find things that are unique to the gene expression and unique. Yeah, let, let me just show, oh yes, yeah. Um, if you compare the responses of all the individual MAPA inhibitors, are there different features selected by the model, or are they really similar for the different pathways? Um, yes, as I, there would, there would be differences if you look at them individually, because um, uh, you get, well, there's, there's no drawing of that here, but up, up here you have all sorts of surface receptors, like uh, EGFR, ERBD2, ERBD3. So 
of course, if you have uh, ERBB2 uh, amplification, like in breast cancer, then there's no point in inhibiting downstream of that. So inhibiting MEK would not help at all, inhibiting the PSV kinase pathway would not help. Uh, would help, I'm sorry, I'm saying it the wrong way around. If you have an uh, amplification here, inhibiting downstream helps. However, uh, because you basically block the signal that's caused by ERBB2 amplification. However, if you now have a BRAF mutation, uh, then in the case of ERBB2, you might be able to block upstream, which would not have an effect when you have a BRAF mutation. So where the mutation is does play a role in, uh, in what features are being selected. But grossly speaking, uh, MAP kinase inhibitors are much different from cell cycle inhibitors. In that sense. So you tend to find features that are confined to this pathway. But individually, they will, will not necessarily be exactly the same. So we're basically done. I can just show you maybe one picture just uh, as a, so what we, what we tried to do in ITOP, just so that you, you, don't, you will not be tested on this, this is more out of, out of interest. So the technique that we use is if you, if you now have, let's say here, three different data types, uh, let's say mutation, gene expression, proteomics, and you would just look at how, these, how the information overlap is between these different data types, which you can do with matrix correlations, then you will find that they all have some overlap because they're all related to each other. Mutations give rise to gene expression, give rise to proteomics, for example. But we use a method, method called partial matrix correlation, which is a similar method that's been used to build Bayesian graphs. You know, if you have a gene expression data set, you know which, want to know which gene influences which gene. You can use this technique to do that. And here we then see, if we look at the partial correlation of mutation and gene expression in the presence of uh, partial correlation of mutation and proteomics in the presence of gene expression, that is zero. Because all the information that's shared between proteomics and, and mutation is actually contained in gene expression. So in this way, we can actually get the true relationship between them. And if we now use actual data and we build this for proteomics, all the upstream data and the gene expression, we see that we find a graph which looks like this. And the interesting thing about this is what is actually absent here. So gene expression is very central which means that this, the shared information between copy number and drug response is all contained in gene expression. And the same holds for all these other data types. All their information that's shared with drug response is contained in gene expression, so choosing the tandem structure as we did was not such a foolish idea after all. The other interesting thing is that gene expression and proteomics are independent predictors of drug response. Because if all the information in proteomics were contained in gene expression, this link would have been zero which means that the information in proteomics is conveyed through gene expression with drug response. And the same the other way around. There is information in gene expression uh, uh, about drug response that's unique to gene expression, not contained in proteomics, because otherwise this link would have been zero, and gene expression would have been operating through proteomics on drug response. And using this information, we can now build more uh, complex tandem models, such as you know, putting the upstream data still at the top without a clear hierarchy between them because as we've seen here there's no hierarchy between them and then uh, because there's no clear hierarchy between proteomics and gene expression it's not gene expression proteomics and then drug response we don't know which one to put first so we can do both we can either do first the upstream data what we cannot explain with that we do with proteomics what remains we explain with gene expression or we can do the other way around First, upstream, what we can't explain, we do with gene expression, what remains with proteomics. And the interesting thing is you find things that are unique to proteomics, which is drug transporters. So they pump the drug out of the cell. So if you measure this by proteomics, you find that those with high expression of these two drug, export, drug uh, exporters or transporters are very resistant cells. Okay? I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs>